I like to think of programming as the study of hypothetical laws of physics. Every computer program simulates its own little universe with its own unique set of rules. Even small programs can produce interesting behavior. This one runs in an infinite loop. At each iteration, it loops over a two-dimensional grid. It adds up the neighbors for each cell, then uses that to decide whether the cell should increase or decrease. Cells greater than one die off. Double buffering avoids overriding data we still need. We allocate extra rows and columns to avoid reading and writing outside of our array. As far as I know, this doesn't represent any real physical process, but it's still fascinating to see what patterns emerge. I'll call this part of the code the update rule. Let's factor it out into a separate function. There are five parameters, the current value of the cell and the current values of the four neighbor cells. The function returns the updated value of the cell. The update rule can be anything we want. I'm interested in a very special update rule, which I'll call the Schrodinger rule. It uses a different data type called a probability amplitude. We'll study these a bit later. For now, we'll just assume that operations like addition and multiplication are well-defined. Other than that, it's similar to our previous rule. It takes the average of the four neighbors, then subtracts the current value of the cell from that. It multiplies that by a constant amplitude, then adds the result to the original value. Let's run our program with the Schrodinger rule and see how it behaves. The grid represents an elementary particle like an electron. Yellow indicates that there's at least a 2% probability of measuring the particle there. The probability amplitudes are complex numbers. These numbers arise naturally in solutions to equations like this. A real number squared is always positive. So we invent a new number, i, which has the property i squared equals negative 1. Arbitrary complex numbers can be written a plus bi, where a and b are real. In our grid of probability amplitudes, each cell has these real and imaginary parts. It's often useful to think of complex numbers geometrically. The horizontal direction corresponds to the real part and the vertical corresponds to the imaginary part. Remember how our simulation was visualized in terms of probability. A complex probability amplitude converts into a probability by taking the squared distance from the origin. Now let's run the Schrodinger rule on our 3 by 3 grid. This is our initial state. 
I've color coded the middle cell, the neighbor cells, and the corner cells. Let's see how it evolves. Let's recall how the Schrodinger rule is calculated. We took the average of the four neighbor cells. Geometrically, this is the centroid of the four points. Then we subtracted the value of the cell from that. We can think of this difference as a vector pointing from the value of the cell to the average of the neighbors. Then we multiplied by a constant probability amplitude. This has real part zero and a small imaginary part. Multiplying by a pure imaginary number rotates the probability amplitude 90 degrees counterclockwise. So we can think of the velocity of the probability amplitude as being perpendicular to that line. Finally, the scale of the imaginary component scales down this velocity vector. A small number is needed here for stability and numerical accuracy. Now let's look at a famous experiment in quantum mechanics. The double slit experiment sends elementary particles through two narrow slits. The pattern that appears on the detector isn't what we would expect if we thought particles were like little billiard balls. Let's see if our simulation can reproduce this pattern. We'll say that the particle enters the grid through two slits at the bottom. We can place two identical probability amplitudes at these locations. This state essentially represents a particle that just passed through each slit with one half probability. I'm going to add a detector on one of the rows. We can plot the values of these cells while the simulation runs. One of my goals for this project was to simulate this experiment. I haven't verified that the numbers are correct, but I think the result is beautiful and I learned a lot in the process of getting there. Simulations turn our computers into microscopes. We can use them to explore an infinite number of universes, including our own. I hope you found it interesting, and I'll see you next time.